the MSC Seaside is one of the biggest cruise ships in the world. Built at a cost of over £1 billion and weighing in at 160,000 tonnes, it's home to more than 6,500 people. With 2,000 guest rooms and 800 staff cabins, it's a giant floating hotel. We can go through 20,000 eggs per day. A glamorous holiday destination. Everything is so much fun. It's, everything is there for you. This is the event you've all been waiting for. And an astonishing feat of engineering. This is uh, one of the most huge generators of the world. But how does this city at sea really work? With exclusive access to a luxury Caribbean voyage, we explore the ship's hidden secrets. This is huge. Without the laundry, nothing gonna happen. We're feeding the fish. It's recycling in a nice way, isn't it? It's quite amazing how all these mechanisms have to work together. And the hidden army of people that keep this extraordinary ship running. Any cruise ship this size is, is the biggest food operation in the world. This is the secret life of the cruise. It's 7 a.m. on Saturday, and the gigantic MSC Seaside has just docked in Port Miami, the biggest cruise ship terminal in the world. In just 12 hours' time, this floating city is heading off for a week-long cruise, travelling more than 2,000 miles across the Caribbean. But before then, it needs to be transformed. There are over 2,000 rooms to clean, 5,000 passengers to disembark, and 15,000 pieces of luggage to come off in just a few hours. Then the ship needs to be refueled, restocked, and refilled with passengers all over again. In the cruise business, it's known as turnaround day, and the clock is ticking. Many people think that we're coming in the day before, we stay overnight, we take a rest, and then the next morning they come on and they see the ship. So many people ask me, when did you arrive? And we say, we arrived this morning. But how can the crew do so much in so little time? Of course, our turnaround day is very hectic, but this is a dance because everything has its timing and it's like a choreography. The day is a complicated ballet where every crew member needs to remember their moves. But this complex dance relies on something a bit more mundane, one very long corridor. Down on deck four, a secret crew passage runs the entire length of the ship it's known as the I-95. It's the only way to move people and cargo quickly around the ship, and it's crucial to the entire operation. How many elevators are we using? Only one? Only one. Guys, hold on the elevator. First thing in the morning, the I-95 is packed, as a hidden army of workers take 15,000 bags off the ship through just two doors in less than two hours. Of course, you see that we have our pool attendants helping us with the luggage because on dinner on days, all hands on deck. We need all the manpower available. Please align all the people right now, please. And it's just as busy port side, where a separate team of dock workers have to work in tandem with the ship's crew. We normally have about 13 forklifts and 57 porters working on a given day. It's extremely <laughs> hectic. It isn't just luggage coming ashore. Over the last week, the ship has accumulated some unpleasant cargo. 50,000 gallons of human waste. Today, five tanker loads of poo will be removed for disposal. For the turnaround machine to work, the ship has to be loaded at the same time it's being emptied. This morning, it needs to be stocked with enough food and drink to last the entire week. This is for those cones, you know? This is for decorations. Giuseppe, dove sono le aragoste qua? Ben Mohammed is in charge of the operation. Eh, l'altro muchacho, eh, questo è il punto. Now this one is a lobster inside, they have to go on board. Every week, I'm talking, it's a chaos, but the chaos have a limit. <laughs> In six hours, Ben and his team will load 160 tons of food onto the ship, worth over a million dollars. 
Throughout the morning, lorries arrive from a complex network of warehouses and suppliers that stretches across the world. It's very complex. We used to be not more than 1,200 guests. The ships are bigger and bigger and bigger. Today is more sophisticated and it's a lot of area to control too, you know. Of course, it can work like wild old machines, you know, like a Swiss wash machine, OK? <laughs> All of this food needs to be loaded onto the ship through a single door. To prevent a backlog, it's delivered immediately to one of 48 separate food stores. Everything has a place, and every crate has to be loaded at a specific time. One late delivery can threaten to disrupt the entire machine. You are late again. Very bad. I don't like it. This is catering on a massive scale. In one week, the ship's passengers will consume 70,000 eggs, 15 tons of meat, and 47 tons of fruit and veg. Every item must be checked rigorously before it goes on board. Nothing can go back on board without the speaker of K9. If the course card gum and it goes on board without the K9, that's trouble. As well as safety, Ben and his team have to check every item for quality. This is halibut. That's come from Alaska. Salmon. For the sushi, look how beautiful. This is a ribeye steak, a 20 ounce. This is our biggest protein product. Blackberry. This is for pastries. Then the strawberry, we don't want them big. We don't want them small. Every week, the checks throw up some surprises. You see what's happened to the pineapple? This is a freezer burr. And what's happened is softness and ruined the product. Even if it's one case, we send the whole lot, you have to give me a new product. In the next two hours, you have to bring me pineapples. I will call the vendors now, and I will tell him that all the pineapple have to be returned. Moving luggage and food is only half the battle. The most important job on turnaround day is to move people. <laughs> All passengers have to be off the ship by 11.30 a.m. This moment is known as the zero count. If any guests are still on board, it means that none of the new passengers can get on. What's the 10.30 count, if you have it for me, please? On board. 500, 500 on board at 10.30. Thank you very much, Miss Ruby. Let's get them out quickly. New passengers are already arriving at Terminal F, where the seaside is docked. Built specifically to handle this ship, it's the biggest terminal at Miami port. And it's already getting busy. We're actually about 120 people left on board, and we already have about 200 people checked in. This is probably the most nerve-wracking point of the day, when you're right between getting people off and getting people on. At this point, we start searching people, looking for them in the rooms, around the pool, the open bars, and uh, just making sure we get down to zero people as quickly as possible. Portside Provisions Master Ben has had some good news. In less than two hours, his network of suppliers have come through. As you can see, I showed you this morning the pineapple return. By 11 o'clock, the replacement was here. The vendors here, we have a good relation with them to supply us what we need. Giorgio, listen, and thank you very much. You just arrived now, I see the pineapple coming out. Thanks, Giorgio, thanks, have a good day. The ship is also being stocked with everything else it needs for the following week, from 7,000 rolls of toilet paper to replacement engine parts. The technical part, the medical part, just name it, you know. For a seven-day trip, the ship also needs more than 1,000 tonnes of fuel. Back above deck, the last of the passengers are finally making their way out. All crew, all crew, zero count. You have zero count. Start the embarkation, zero count. Brilliant! With the holiday makers gone, it's the only time in the entire week when there are no passengers on board. 
Cruise director Gene Young uses this time for a quick motivational speech. Well, attention all crew, attention all crew. This is your cruise director, Gene Young, speaking. Congratulations on finishing another incredible voyage. I put the challenge out to you, my friends, my family members, this cruise. Let us say hello to each other. Let us be the best that we can be, because you are the best. You are wonderful, and our guests love you. Let us do it. Let us do it great, and let us do it again. Thank you. The respite doesn't last for long. Five minutes later, it's time for boarding. So stand by for boarding. And the week starts all over again. By midday, the front desk is checking in up to a thousand passengers an hour. The holidaymakers are already exploring the ship. Such a best impression, eh? Wow, just wow. Wow, yeah. Shiny, bright. Can't wait to go have a look around. So we're about to go into our room. Oh, it's, it's open. It's open. open. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is nice. This is nice. Oh wow. What a massive mirror. <laughs> Downstairs on the I-95, another group of people are getting their first glimpse of the ship. And things look very different down here. You're new in China? Yeah? Where are you coming from? Honduras. Honduras? Yeah, Philippines. Philippines. Philippines, how are you? Welcome on board. Yeah? On every cruise, there are up to 200 new members of staff, as up to a tenth of the crew leave for holiday or to work on other ships. This room is that we uh, receive our crew members. We're going to make all the paperwork for immigration. We're going to sign them on. They get their cabin assignment. At the onboard uniform store, they have to keep uniforms for every job in every size. Just one tiny part of a hidden world, but crucial for keeping this ship running. It's time for the captain to make his final preparations for departure. It's always uh, exciting now to be in common over such huge, modern and beautiful place. But how do you even begin to move a vessel of this size? OK, after the session, and device when you are ready. The engines stir into life, transferring 80,000 horsepower to the six-metre-high propellers at the back of the ship. Yellow side. OK, yeah. both side clear, very good. Hidden beneath the waterline, the ship engages its thrusters. Smaller propellers built into the side of the ship. All seven thrusters are in operation. We can advise the bridge now. Bridge from forward, all thrusters clear. All thrusters clear. Copy, forward, all thrusters clear. The ship is equipped with seven of these thrusters in total, allowing the 160,000-ton vessel to pull away from the dock with inch-perfect precision. After five minutes, the ship is safely in the middle of the channel. The propellers engage, and the seaside begins to make its way forward into open ocean. 14 hours after arriving in Miami, the MSC Seaside is on its way again. It's day two of the MSC Seaside's Caribbean cruise, and the ship is powering through the Atlantic Ocean. Over 300 meters long and weighing 160,000 tons, the vessel is part of a new generation of monster cruise ships. If it was on land, it would be one of the 50 biggest hotels in the world. There are over six and a half thousand people on board. Okay, adesso Italia si, eh? Adesso Italia, sexy, sexy, sexy. The ship is huge. We're losing the kids. We're getting lost all the time. Um, we can't find the same bar straight away. You know, we're looking for ages. When we first got on the ship in Miami, we were just, you know, how big it was. Um, obviously described as a floating hotel, but it just seemed more than that when you see it. 20 storeys high, the ship has nine restaurants, 11 bars, shopping plazas, 
a gym, a thousand seat theatre, a spa, a nightclub, a bowling alley, a full size basketball court, and one of the biggest water parks at sea. This ship is not like a ship, it's like a city, it's got everything. It's unbelievable. But this floating city needs a vast amount of electricity to function. So how does the ship get all the power it needs? The secret lies here, buried in the depths of the ship, in the engine room. Noisy and boiling hot, it couldn't be more different to the glitz and glamour above deck. But the engine room is the seaside's beating heart. Here, four massive engines work as supersized electric generators. If you love an uh, engine the generator, this is the best place. This is uh, our big generator, no, that we call the big brother. We have uh, 14 cylinders. This is uh, one of the most huge generators on the world. Combined, they produce 80,000 horsepower in total. This raw power is then converted to electricity. The engines can produce enough electricity to power 50,000 homes. And they also drive this ship across the ocean. The engine room is also the key to another vital commodity that the ship needs in bucket loads. Water. On board, there are 30 swimming pools and jacuzzis, and more than 3,000 showers and taps. And every department on the ship, from the galleys to the engine, requires a constant supply of clean, fresh water. In total, the ship needs 250,000 gallons of it every day. So how does it quench this thirst? This is uh, one of the most huge and big system of a fresh water generator production in the world. So what we do? We take the seawater here through this pipe, come 600 tons of water per hour. Underwater, huge pumps are constantly sucking in water from the sea. Then, in two industrial desalination machines, waste steam and heat from the engines boil the seawater to remove the salt. Once treated, the distillated seawater is clean enough to drink. It's pumped throughout the ship. This water comes out from our shower or from our hand and wash. And for swimming, booty, boots, everywhere, you see water to come from this system. The system can produce 3,000 tonnes of fresh water a day, enough to fill 400 of these swimming pools. But this floating hotel doesn't just rely on secret systems. It also depends on a hidden army. Every day, 60 cleaners are constantly at work, cleaning the ship's 20 storeys of staircases and 10 kilometres of corridors. Meanwhile, a team of 112 cabin stewards have to strip and make more than 2,000 beds. A thousand of these linen bags are filled every day. But how does the ship deal with so much laundry? Hidden away on deck three, another department is absolutely crucial to the smooth running of the ship. Oh, this is, this is huge. Without the laundry, the ship is not operational. Everybody thinks the housekeeping and the dining room without the food cannot be operational. No, without the laundry, nothing can happen. <laughs> Almost everybody on board relies on regular deliveries of clean laundry. In one day, they have to process 14,000 pool towels, 10,000 sheets and 60,000 napkins. Everything come down here. If you're looking at the hotel in Las Vegas, they have 2,000 rooms as well. The difference is, in the hotel, they have different uh, laundry operations that they bring it to them every day and they collect the dirty ones. In here, everything is in-house and so everything is need to be connected within your operation. If one machine broke down, 
I'm already on a crunch time because the restaurant cannot operate without the tablecloth and the napkins. To get through this never-ending deluge of linen, the laundry is staffed round the clock by a team of 28 people. Again, the ship's engines play a vital role in powering this department. They produce huge amounts of waste heat and steam, which is harvested before being piped here to the massive machines. This tunnel washer alone is capable of cleaning up to 1,000 sheets every hour. After the washing cycle, a robotic arm moves the material to one of four huge dryers. This is the only thing that can accommodate the needs of the ship. Without this, we can never meet the expectation. Once the laundry is washed and dried, another machine presses and folds it into perfect squares. Make sure you get the end to end like this, then it, the, the sheets is totally spread out. See, well pressed. See that? OK, continue what you're doing. And you need to be faster. The next person just have to collect the finished product and goes into the storage place. Very, very impressive how this machine is designed. It's very beautiful. With a turnaround time of one hour, the newly cleaned, dried and pressed laundry is ready to go. I'm very proud to manage this beautiful operation. I am just as proud as a cow. <laughs> like, how did I say that? <laughs> Upstairs, the ship's army of cleaners have another important role to play. Every day, they need to dispose of all the rubbish. With 6,500 passengers and crew living on board, you can imagine that how much garbage being generated on a daily basis. So how does the seaside deal with this growing mountain of waste? Down in the ship's onboard garbage room, an army of sorters have to painstakingly separate it all by hand. When the crew member come on board, I take a class, each person being trained how we need to separate the waste on board, and it is their responsibility. Only after it's been meticulously sorted can the waste be processed. Every day, this room receives 10 tonnes of garbage, including 2,000 cans and 3,000 glass bottles. We do not want to pollute the sea, you know. We don't want to discharge the ship. This is one of the most eco-friendly ships in the world. 80% of the waste generated on the ship can be recycled. The rest is taken back to Miami. Just keeping this ship afloat takes an army of people. But perhaps the biggest task is keeping everyone on board fed. People always ask me, how many meals do you serve a day? And I say, well, most passengers, they have only one meal. They start in the morning and they finish at night. They eat continuously. It's only one meal for them, right? <laughs> but how do you go about feeding the 5,000? The key is sheer manpower. 800 people work in the food and beverage team. That's more than half of the entire crew. Together, they cook, plate and serve 15 tonnes of food a day. Hola, buenas noches. Every evening, passengers eat at two massive restaurants. Capable of serving 1,500 people at a time, they run three separate sittings a night. First sitting, very quiet. Second sitting, very busy and extremely busy on the third sitting, OK? Let's go and get them, huh? Thank you, guys. At 5 p.m., the team kicks into action. With 250 well-drilled crew members working in two huge galleys, Thomas has to make sure everyone is up to standard. Don't cook too much fish in advance, OK? Pieces like that don't need to be on there, right? Don't serve that, OK? okay. You make sure you are, you're decorating the food with chopped parsley or something huh, all the time. 
Any cruise ship this size is, is the biggest food operation in the world because it's not like a hotel. A hotel might also have 5,000 beds, but half of them don't eat in the hotel. Here, they have no choice. There's nowhere else they can go. And guests don't just need to eat. With 11 bars on board, the alcohol stores are some of the best stocked on the ship. One of the first priorities is ensuring that we have the nectar of life, the nectar of fun, which we all know to be alcohol. So we've got uh, the cordials, the liqueurs, the beers, the, the water, you need to rehydrate, and then you repeat. In one cruise, thirsty passengers will go through 2,000 bottles of spirits, 8,000 bottles of wine, and 10,000 litres of beer. We're not a party boat. It's a boat that caters for everyone's individual thirst. <laughs> the ship's huge restaurants are coming towards the end of their first sitting. And in the galleys, a dedicated team of workers are slicing and dicing a mountain of produce. They're helped by some industrial-sized equipment. It's basically uh, washing our fruit before we process them. A machine like that, you probably would only find in a commercial plant where they make uh, canned fruit and things like that. We've got one here, beautiful. It's just the right length for me. <laughs> to have my shakus, you know? <laughs> we can actually have a spin dryer in there when you have a different kind of fruit, almost like a, a close spin dryer. This is probably the cleanest pineapple on the ship right now that we have. Together, these machines can power through 300 kilograms of fruit and veg every hour. In all my time of uh, working on cruise ship, this is the first time that I see this kind of technology on a ship. It's the state-of-the-art stuff. The chefs also need some super-sized kitchenware. Some of these uh, boilers, they hold about 300, 250, 300 litres, some of them. And uh, this is what we need here, you know? When we make a model sauce, I make 300 liters every day. Just for model sauce, every day. And it's gone at the end of the day. Even the dishwashing is an industrial operation. After each sitting, every single plate needs to be washed. This is the, uh, the clean side of the operation. Comes out here, gets dried, piled up and pushed back into the operation. We actually need everything for the second sitting and the third sitting. The food has a rest after the first sitting. We replenish the line, but these guys, it's continuous. And cruise ship catering has one more secret. Every day, a tonne and a half of food is left over by passengers. That's enough to feed another 500 people. So what happens to all this waste? In each galley, giant grinders crush the leftovers before it drops three floors below where it's stored in tanks. Then, when out at sea, the ship discharges this waste as fish food. Sometimes on the day when we're allowed to discharge the uh, food waste, uh, you can spot some dolphins out here and they're following us because of that, you know? So we're feeding the fish. It's uh, recycling in a nice way, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and all this eating has other consequences. With six and a half thousand passengers and crew downing at least three meals a day, the ship's sewage system works hard. But this city at sea can't have normal sewers. So how does it deal with all the poo? It all happens here, in the bowels of the ship. All the human waste on the ship coming here in this room. This is an advanced range water treatment. Every day, this secret sewer has to treat 30 tons of human waste. On board, it's known as black water. When I come first day, when I feel this smell, I didn't like, but day after day, this is normal. Eh? Nobody likes uh, the work here because so you smell. Also, it's very hot, but what we can do? Somebody must keep the system in good position. The seaside has its own specially developed system for processing the waste. 
First, under huge pressure, the solid is separated from the liquid in a pressing machine. The liquid coming here and going to stage one. Solid coming here and going down in the slurry tank. The solid waste is removed every week in Miami. The liquid needs further treatment. This is uh, stage one. The side is already dirty. 2,000 gallons a day filters down into these tanks. So now I show you the how is the water in the, the beginning. You can see the color. It's very, very, very dirty. The black water is filtered until it's almost as clean as drinking water. The water passes the filtration, separation, passes from this membrane and uh, coming to here in this tank. You can see this is final product. Can you drink? Yes, if you want. <laughs> this water doesn't get drunk. Some of it is siphoned off to cool the massive engines. The rest is safe enough to be discharged into the sea. Seven a.m. on the bridge of the MSC Seaside. She's travelled almost a thousand miles from Miami, and in one hour is due to dock in Ocho Rios, Jamaica. But the port throws up some particularly difficult challenges for a ship of this size. So this is the port. I mean, here is just a big coral reef that we enter from this direction. As you may see, a vessel is docked here. Reefs are here. If you just delay a bit uh, the moment that you start to change your route, uh, hey, you can easily hit something. Or if you don't control your, well your speed, you can easily ground, which is even worse. So yeah, the vessel at the end finish uh, very close. There are no marginal mistakes. So how do you navigate something this complex? While out at sea, the ship travels on autopilot. But as they approach land, the captain assumes full control. OK, we can keep proceeding with this course and speed, no problem. OK. Now, if anyone on the bridge makes a navigational error, the ship's computer will not correct it. As the seaside enters the narrow port, the key is to slow down as much as possible. Mission the wheel. Mission the wheel. Yes, mission. It approaches first at three, then two knots. Any faster, and the 300-meter-long ship will be almost impossible to control. Then trust 30% uh, to starboard. By this point, the ship is less than 200 meters from another vessel and 150 meters away from surrounding reefs. It now needs to pivot 45 degrees towards the dock without any forward movement. The ship is so big that the team move to the bridge wing. Take over the wheel on the starboard wing and take over all the control. Here, they have a better view of the pier while maintaining full control of the ship. Underwater, the ship's seven thrusters kick into action, rotating the vessel towards the dock with inch-perfect precision. Meters away from the pier, all the thrusters stop turning, and inch by inch, the ship drifts into position. You should uh, really land softly with zero residual speed, in practice, I used to say it's like kiss the pier. 405 clear. We are in position. While most of the passengers are off the ship, the crew have a vital duty to perform. Every week, the ship's officers run a full emergency drill. Uh, check on aft part, aft part. During a maneuvering, we hit the pier on the compartment approximately four and five. Today, the officers have come up with an emergency scenario to test all the crew. Uh, Captain, we understand the compartment oh, affected are five and four. 
Safety officer Marco is dispatched to assess the extent of the imaginary damage. Yes, they jump. For speed, Marco uses the ship's vertical escape ladders. Hidden passageways running from deck one to four. Bridge on deck one, compartment number five. We have two meters of water on deck one, compartment number five. Compartment number five, we have two meters of water. The ship is divided into ten vertical zones. In an emergency, they're designed to be watertight to contain any breach of the hull. For today's drill, two of these compartments are supposedly taking on water. Charlie Alpha. Charlie Alpha. As soon as the bridge sounds the crew alert, every member of staff has to drop what they're doing. All the crew members on board, they have a second duty in case of emergencies. They can be people in charge of the evacuation, people in charge of medical team, people from fire team, lifeboat preparation. They have uh, many, many different duties all around the ship. The safety officers check that the crew are confident with their duties by pretending to be lost guests. Can I stay here? No. Please Why? I want to just talk with you a few, minute, few minutes. Please carry on your way. We try sometimes to scare them, to give them pressure in order to maybe feel what can happen in a really emergency. It's the only way. The drill is over. This is a good day. With the drill over, the crew can return to their normal jobs. But what's daily life like for the 1,500 crew members living on board? Hidden within the ship, there is a second city, one that passengers never get to see. Here, in a maze of corridors, there are three crew restaurants, two private crew bars. Mi casa es su casa. Come in, come in. And 740 crew cabins. So this is uh, my cabin. I'm uh, a senior officer, so it's a larger cabin and I don't have to share it, which is uh, a big perk on uh, ship life. Uh, but you can see, really, it's not um, the biggest space in the world either. But on a, a big ship, this is all that I get to call my own. The officers are lucky. This is our corridor. Most of the crew live in less luxurious surroundings. Here we are, home sweet home. When you're in these cabins, you're a bit like... Stuck. Oh, you feel a bit stuck confined. and confined. Yeah. Beds. Jess is on the top bunk. I'm on the bottom bunk. I miss waking up and like looking outside of it the window. It is a bit strange and not having a window in here. And we don't really see daylight for quite a while. Yeah. It, then when you do go outside, your eyes are a bit like... Yeah. like ah! <laughs> but it's but then when we want to have a nap, it's good Great. because it's pitch black in the rooms. I think crazy is the word we'd use to sum up this whole experience. Yeah. Crazy. It's like living in a little bubble. Mm -hmm. We call it a ship bubble, don't we? Ship bubble, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, you're in your complete own little world. We work together, eat together, we do everything together. And life on a cruise ship can be a lot of fun. So nice. So nice. All of us entertainers are getting off. Hey. Freedom. This is the privilege of doing a cruise, guys. Oh, no, it's not the TV. This is. <laughs> <laughs> After a few hours off the ship, it's back to work. Then, with all passengers and crew back on board, the seaside sets sail again and heads out into open ocean. Early evening on the MSC Seaside. While the passengers enjoy the last of the sun, the ship's in-house theatre company are in the midst of rehearsals. So let's check now your position now. We are the dancers of MSC Seaside, and we're part of a cast of about 40. We, we live right. more in the changing room than yeah, we do yeah, in our cabins. Yeah. Spend more time <laughs> this here than anywhere else. Yeah. Like everything on this ship, the entertainment comes super-sized. Every single night, the company performs to up to 3,000 people across three shows. 
That's a bigger audience than in any theatre in London's West End. There's a full-scale lighting rig, a state-of-the-art sound system and a dedicated backstage team. Even the props and costumes have been specially commissioned for the ship. And here we are greeted this is Ruben's dad. By, the di <laughs> by the dinosaur. Do you know the dinosaur? Do you know the dinosaur? There we go, we've named it. And it has a camera, so the person who's inside. Who's inside? Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, Ow! That is spiky. <laughs> it's it's but his eyes move as well. Do you Guys, it has a little light. fan in there. Yeah, yeah it's a little fan in case he gets hot. These Crazy. are <laughs> yeah. some of the costumes. Yeah. And it's just like costume after costume, headdress yeah. after headdress. Trees, we yeah. have trees. <laughs> this is like how we get from one side of the stage to the other quickly. Sometimes a secret, gone. secret passageway. Secret. That's what we call it. We made normally all of you with the fans. The cast rehearse for up to seven hours a day, then go straight into performing. We usually work around 60 hours a week. Long hours, Long hours. hard work, get ready, warm up. It's just then a continuous rehearsal. But we do it because we love it, yeah. Mine and remain there. With rehearsals over, the cast have just over half an hour to get ready for the premiere. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Timeless. <laughs> By 10 p.m., the last show is over. The cast have been on the go for 12 hours straight. Now sleep. Yeah, now uh, I'm having a drink. Now beer. <laughs> Eight storeys above, on the bridge, the atmosphere is very different. The vessel is still motoring through the ocean at 22 knots. But the captain can't work 24 hours a day, so who's in charge? Throughout the night, three-man teams work ships on the bridge. Their job is known as the watch. We are uh, just outside the, the, the bridge. I'm a uh, first officer and I'm uh, head of the watch. The bridge must remain pitch black at all times throughout the night. The first five minutes are not easy because it's all, all black, you cannot see nothing. Each shift lasts just four hours. Any longer, and there's a risk that the watchers could lose their concentration. Current is uh, pushing. pushing yeah, you're pushing to not. Yeah, I think uh, I take the charge at the going, Okay. The bridge is equipped with millions of dollars worth of modern equipment, but at night, the watch relies on some much simpler technology. We are watching the other vessel moving. So with the binocular, we can see their light, especially with the small boat, a fishing boat, that uh, many times uh, are not plotted on the radar screen. Looking after this billion-pound vessel is a huge responsibility. We have 1,000 passengers and 1,000 crew members. So if uh, we make any mistake on the bridge, there are many people here. And our job is to let them feel uh, safe The bridge isn't the only place that has to operate throughout the night. Across the ship, a secret nighttime army is at work, making sure the seaside runs smoothly 24 hours a day. Four floors of outside decking needs to be scrubbed. Every restaurant given a deep clean, and every public space hoovered from top to bottom. On board, more than 100 staff work through the night. And one department in particular is a hive of activity. The ship's in-house bakery. Fresh bread has to be made from scratch all night, every night. In the bakery, working 24 hours. The night people coming at 8 o'clock, preparation all bread for the breakfast. Croissant, pan chocolate, all the breakfast is the night people. All the bread you eat on board is fresh. In one night shift, this bakery will make 5,000 croissants and 3,000 pano chocolat. And that's just for breakfast. 
Over the course of a week's cruise, the bakers will produce 7,000 donuts, 10,000 pizzas, and 70,000 bread rolls. When coming outside, I want to see the bread is perfect. The ship is on its way back to Miami, but there's one final challenge to face. How to bring a 160,000 ton ship into one of the narrowest ports in America in the pitch black night. By 4 a.m., the ship is one mile outside the port of Miami. They might have all the latest technology on board, but to get into port safely, they need some expert local help. Captain John Nitkin is a Miami port pilot. It's his job to guide these massive cruise ships safely into dock. This morning, he's meeting up with the seaside. MSC Seaside, good morning. We are outbound to you now. What side is your pilot ladder? Okay, we copy port side, very good. We are headed to you now. We always ask the captain, have you been to Miami before? And if they say no, we tell them you're in for quite a, quite a ride. And after, they all agree that this is one very narrow, very fast, crazy place. There she is, she's a beauty. She's the, the biggest one in Miami right now. First, the most dangerous part of the whole maneuver for John. He has to jump from his moving boat up onto the seaside. There have been a lot of accidents and pilots lost climbing that ladder. Alongside this ship, we continue. The giant cruise ship has to make sure it holds its course precisely so it doesn't smash into the smaller boat alongside. Safety. Okay, we hold this course. Once on board, John heads straight to the bridge. Where's my captain? How are you? Nice to there see you. I hear you. Good to see you. Every port has its own pilots. They're the world experts in their own small piece of the ocean. We know the waters here and the conditions better than anybody. On the bridge, John takes control of the con, the movement of the vessel. Hey, thank you, Captain. You're welcome. Excellent. Pilot is like the conductor, and it is one big symphony, and everything has to be timed just right. But bringing something this size into Miami isn't easy. Port Miami is very narrow. When I started 30 years ago, we didn't know what is the capacity, the largest ship that the port could handle. We're now there. Starboard five. Yes. On the surface, Miami port easily looks wide enough for the seaside, but beneath the water, it's a different story. To allow these huge ships to enter the port, a shallow channel has been dug out of the rock seabed. But it's only 100 meters wide, leaving very little space either side. John has to get it right, or the massive ship will run into the side of the channel. The ships have grown and changed. But the thing that hasn't changed are these narrow rock channels. In these ports like Miami, everything is feet and inches. The huge ship is also susceptible to small changes in wind conditions. A cruise ship is a giant sail, and they call each balcony with the little partitions parachutes. They all catch the wind, so when the wind is on the side of the ship, the big challenge is keeping these ships safely within the channel boundaries. John has to make sure that the vessel stays dead straight to avoid hitting the side of the channel. Then, over 20 minutes, the seaside has to execute a perfect 180 before it can come into dock. The weight of the responsibility is really heavy. 
everybody's watching me do this, it doesn't look that hard. That's because we're doing a good job. It takes a lot of patience, skill, and you have to have pretty much ice water in your veins. As the ship approaches the dock, the officers have one final job to do. Five meters. Nine meters. Safety officer Marco has to line up the ship perfectly alongside the gangways. Uh, we are moving a step. We are almost in position. Half a meter. Half a meter. All done up. Inch by inch, they guide the seaside home. At 5.15 precisely, the ship docks, marking the end of its 2,000-mile journey. Then, as the sun comes up over Miami port, the ship's hidden army readies itself for another turnaround day. Another 5,000 passengers. Another week at sea. The cruise comes to an end, and then the guests go home. The guests re-embark, and we do it all over again. Just big satisfaction. No, that, OK, it's done again. OK, now we go. It's the beginning of another week in the secret life of the cruise.